Our applications have come from all across the state, some out of state, so we're excited to see who gets picked. This is the first time, as far as I know, of Honor Flight taking that many Vietnam veterans. It all just fit together, and being it's the 40th anniversary of the end of the Vietnam War, um, it just was the perfect time to do it. The sad part is we got over 500 applications. We can only take 115. There we go, guys. First veteran. First veteran is Dennis Winkler. Dennis, Dennis Winkler. Dennis Winkler. Winkler. We got Robert right here. Hi, is this Bernie? Hey Bernie, do you remember applying to go on the Yellow Ribbon Honor Flight out to Washington, D.C.? You do? Yes. The excitement, they couldn't believe that they were picked. You know, and they questioned, is this, are you joking me? Yes, I'm telling the truth, Ron. Yeah, I'm glad to hear you're excited. And I'm happy to say that you've been one of our veterans that we've picked. No, I'm not it. No, really, Charles. And we welcome you aboard the Honor Flight. Well, thank you again. I want to thank you for your service to our country, and we look forward to meeting you. I was surprised at how many cried and how many needed to take a moment. I was surprised at um, a veteran who had said to me, you know what, I think I've changed my mind, but can my best friend go? Because he deserves it more. Well, I can tell you that out of the other hundred vets that are going along, most of them haven't seen the wall. They were pulled out of their, their workplaces and their schools and their homes and they were sent halfway around the world to fight a war that they didn't really have any part in. They all know men on that wall. Everybody's gonna know a name. Um, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be very, very emotional. It's 5 a.m. Friday, August 2nd, and the EAA grounds are already buzzing with anticipation. The Sitter family, like all these veterans, has been up for hours. We're just all a little bit emotional now, too, so. <laughs> He's been crying all morning. <laughs> so. 47 years ago, I boarded a plane here to go to Vietnam. There was nobody here to send me off. He's never been there. He's never been able to do that on his own. So it's good to be able to, you know, address those feelings with a group of men who've all been in the same boat and all going through the same thing. And they've all got each other's back. And I told him, I says, it's okay because everybody else is going to feel the same way. So if you have to cry, cry. 115 Vietnam veterans, all but a handful from Wisconsin, arrive at Whitman Regional Airport in Oshkosh. Thank you very much. Honor flights during EAA have become the norm in recent years, but this one is different. I've had mixed emotions all week about it. This honor flight is strictly for a group of men who serve their country, only to be forsaken and forgotten when they came home. More than four decades after the Vietnam War came to an end, these veterans still feel a brokenness inside. The thought of visiting the Vietnam Memorial Wall is overwhelming for many. Some of them probably still won't be able to walk up to it. You know, it, it's just uh, all their all their friends, all their compatriots, their classmates, their buddies are on that wall, and they aren't names to them. They're they're human beings. To lift the men's spirits, an old Vietnam radio show is remembered. <laughs> Congressional Medal of Honor recipient and Wisconsin native Gary Wetzel is on hand for the send-off. His message... A lot of you guys are going to go down for the first time, and it's, uh, it's kicking a butt. ...is direct and full of encouragement. And you're going you're gonna to get a job done, so guys, God bless, and enjoy the day. Each and every one in this room has got friends they went to high school with, or friends that they serve with, or friends that died in their arms. And this is a healing process for everybody, and it's, it's just so nice that the organization is bringing all these guys down to say, hey, thank you. Before the veterans head for the plane, they bow their heads. 
Be with all of us today on this journey, especially our veterans. Enable us to maintain the principles that we pledged as veterans of Vietnam. The prayer is followed by taps. Inside these veterans, emotions are swelling. They're grateful to be together. It's a brotherhood and at least I'll have support and they'll have support. Your tears today? Yes, there will be. <laughs> Starting now. <laughs> it's a journey they never imagined just a few weeks ago. But here they are. Their honor flight is ready. It's time to go back, to remember, to pay tribute. Arriving at Reagan International Airport, the Vietnam veterans are immediately caught off guard, in a good way. The airport is full of cheers, hugs, and thank yous. The reception brings out smiles and tears. I'm just surprised at all the people that are out here to say welcome home. It never had that. Outside the airport, the veterans fill three tour buses. The destination, the heart of our nation's capital. You cross the Potomac River, you just left the Commonwealth of Virginia, you're now entering Washington, D.C. The vets step off the bus at the National Mall just outside the Lincoln Memorial. Once again, a crowd of complete strangers is here to greet them. I say to all the people out here, thanks for uh, coming out and welcoming us home now, at least, you know complete turnaround from when we came back. A group picture is captured on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Just a few hundred yards away though, the wall is waiting. More than 90% of these men have never been here before. This is my first time here and it's, it's, I've heard it's very moving, very emotional. I feel a little nervous right now, you know, and uh, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of stories told today. My memories are very vivid, good ones and bad ones. You look at the names and there's bodies behind every one of those names, that's the thing. Mostly young people, so it's gonna be emotional. The names of more than 58,000 U.S. service members are etched in the black granite of the Vietnam Memorial Wall. Almost every veteran on this trip finds a name they know, and in most cases, there are more than one. I'm looking at Marvin Prupson from Hilbert, Wisconsin, and uh, he grew up across the uh, street from me. There's a couple more down the line that I need to see. I had a friend that didn't make it in 10 days. He was killed on his ninth day over there. To the average tourist, the wall is a poignant memorial to American lives lost. To these veterans, it represents a part of their lives. Memories come back as they scan the names and trace them to take home. I just looked at them and I, I didn't see the name, I saw the man. I got touched very much, especially by a friend of mine, Donald Lass, and Francis Valdez I went to school with. It's hard to explain what you feel. You gotta be there to know it. As you can put your hand up on that wall, you feel like some sort of magnetism or electricity. Tim Baranzik has a cousin on the wall. This Bible and army cap he leaves behind is his way of paying respect. And I hope maybe with a lot of the veterans today coming to the Vietnam Wall, a lot of them will take care of some issues that they've had for 40 some years and leave them here. For more than an hour, the veterans spend time with their buddies who never made it home. As painful as this is, they say they wouldn't trade this opportunity, this moment, for anything. Yeah, quite, a, quite an honor to be here and uh, they deserve the honor. They're the, they're, they're the guys, the heroes, they're the guys that made the sacrifices.
knowing that you can see them, you know they're there, you can see the names, but you can also see your reflection in the wall and you're with them again. And that, more than anything else, is why these vets leave the wall with a sense of peace and healing. They've never felt this way before. Today, they finally had the chance to say goodbye. You did a good job. You'll never be forgotten. After paying respect at the Vietnam Memorial Wall, the veterans arrive at the National Museum of American History. A restored Huey helicopter brings back memories of frequent missions into the jungle. Mm, several hundred. It wasn't a hopping in, it was a hopping out that was a problem. <laughs> the Vietnam War first began in 1959, five years after the division of the country by the Geneva Accords. Vietnam had been split into two, with a communist government in the north and a democratic government in the south. The north launched a guerrilla campaign in South Vietnam, led by Viet Cong units, with the goal of uniting the country under communist rule. In August 1964, a U.S. warship was attacked by North Vietnamese torpedo boats in the Gulf of Tonkin. Following this attack, Congress passed the Southeast Asia Resolution, which allowed President Lyndon Johnson to conduct military operations in the region without a declaration of war. On March 2, 1965, U.S. aircraft began bombing targets in Vietnam, and the first troops arrived. You know, I got on a boat ship uh, to go to Vietnam on my birthday in 1965. The first month I was there, three fellows that I met in jungle school in Vietnam, they died. So that was the, the wake up that all of a sudden you realize that people that you were with die and they're, it, they're dead. Commanded by General William Westmoreland, U.S. troops won victories over Viet Cong and North Vietnamese forces around Chu Lai and in the Ia Drang Valley in the summer of 65. The number of troops exceeded 200,000 that year and reached 540,000 in 1968. There were, there were days you never laughed so hard or cried so hard. And it's it just the, the circumstances, you know, of course, would dictate that. Following these defeats, the North Vietnamese avoided fighting conventional battles and focused on engaging U.S. troops in small unit actions in the sweltering jungles of South Vietnam. In 1968, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong launched the massive Tet Offensive. Tet shook the confidence of the American people and the media who had thought the war was going well. As a result of Tet, President Lyndon Johnson opted not to run for re-election and was succeeded by Richard Nixon. In 1969, President Nixon proposed the so-called Vietnamization which gave South Vietnam greater responsibility in fighting the war while still receiving American aid as well as air and naval support if required. However, the 1972 Easter Offensive put a big question mark on the policy's effectiveness, suggesting that the South Vietnam forces could not wage a full-scale war against the North without considerable support from the U.S. Forty years later, many of these veterans are still angry over the decision-making in Washington during the war. Well, that's the way it has been throughout history. You know, it's the young men that fight the wars. And it's the old poops that sit back here at home running this country that uh, tell you what you're going to do. In 1970, the war escalated into Vietnam's neighbors as Nixon attempted to destroy Viet Cong supply bases in the south, in Laos and Cambodia. The mistrust of the U.S. government, though, was in full swing, provoking tremendous anti-war protests in the U.S. and around the world. We had a change from uniforms to civilian clothes when we got to LAX. So we didn't have to deal with the crowds 
of protesters in and around the airports. I went to a VFW post after I got out and the only guy that would talk to me was a membership chairman. Couldn't get in a sheep's head game, nothing. You know, we went to serve because I was drafted and you went. You know, I mean, it wasn't like, boy, I did it because, you know, and I, people just didn't understand. We were forgotten by the people. More importantly, I feel we were forgotten by the government. Eventually, the fall of Saigon on April 30th, 1975, marked the end of the Vietnam War, and Vietnam was reunified as a communist country. As the veterans reflect back on the areas in Vietnam they served and fought the bloodiest of battles, the horror of war resurfaces. Breaks me up. What we did was recover, identify, and transport. Uh, it was demanding. American ground forces were directly involved in the Vietnam War between 1965 and 1973. During that span, one out of every 10 soldiers who served paid the ultimate sacrifice. Well, I look at it as, quite frankly, it's a waste of 58,000 some odd lives. Another 153,000 U.S. service members came home wounded, and nearly 2,000 were declared missing in action. In comparison, North Vietnamese forces suffered close to two million casualties. Before the veterans return home, there's one more stop, Arlington National Cemetery, to witness the changing of the guard at the tomb of the unknown soldier. The veterans stand silent and pay tribute. It's a fitting end to a day filled with all kinds of emotions. But what these veterans don't realize is what's still to come when their honor flight touches down in Wisconsin. Believing their emotional journey is winding down, a surprise 36,000 feet above the ground. Michael Weaver. As is customary on all Old Glory Honor Flights, the veterans receive a special tribute, mail call, letters and cards from family and friends back home, thanking them for their service and sacrifice. I can't believe them. They're from my relatives, brothers I haven't seen, and nieces and nephews. I, I didn't expect this. None of us expect that. It gets a little bit choked up here. <laughs> I read a couple of them and some from my kids. Just how proud they are and, you know, what an honor for me to do this. So, it's cool. I can't even open them. I, it's too emotional. I can't, I can't even read them. It's just overwhelming. It's something I never expected. It was awesome. Tears, of course. All my friends. Chris, he's trying to find his picture. Pretty neat. For some of these veterans, this mail call is truly a first. It's the first time that I've received any mail ever about Vietnam. Ever. When I was over there, I didn't receive any mail. It's just outstanding. And I'm, I'm very honored uh, to, and then from the governor, from the congressman, and it just makes me feel like uh, I'm really a part of this country, and I'm in, I'm, I'm, I deserve the honor that I'm getting today. Before, I didn't feel like I deserved it. It finally meant to me that I had a welcome home. People accepted us now. Before, they didn't. And I just feel like we're accepted now. That feeling is about to grow immensely. As the Yellow Ribbon Honor Flight touches down in Oshkosh, more than 12,000 people are waiting to welcome these veterans home. We want to welcome home 
we want to put our arms around him. And we've got some special surprises for him tonight also. I hope it will make help make their lives uh, better given their experiences in Vietnam and what they gave to the country and that maybe they can rest a little easier uh, having their service appreciated. More than 40 years after their unwelcome return home, these veterans experience a moment they never dreamt was possible. People of all ages waving American flags, cheering and saying thank you. As the vets make their way through the crowd, they reunite with their adoring families. James Sitter embraces his wife. I never had a welcome home before. This is my welcome home. It meant closure for all of us. There were 58,000 names on that wall, and each and every one of us had an opportunity to say goodbye and put closure and put everything to rest, and hopefully I'll be a better person after this. Before the veterans conclude their honor flight mission, there's one more order of business. 1973, I get a call from Bob Hope. Tony Orlando is about to sing his famous song. You know, 40 years ago, I recorded a little song called Tie Yellow Ribbon. And 40 years ago, Bob Hope had me on stage at the Cotton Bowl to welcome home our POWs. A longtime veteran supporter, Orlando says in many ways, Vietnam vets are the most compassionate veterans our country has ever known. Welcome home means more to them than you can imagine. They were spat on, they were cursed at, they were never respected. The interesting thing about the Vietnam vet is, you know, I've been working for veterans' causes ever since that day in 73. And I can tell you, if you go to an airport and you see those uh, veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, the first people online to welcome them home are Vietnam vets, because they don't want to ever see what happened to them ever happen again. With the sun setting over EAA Air Venture, the veterans are taken back one more time. But this time, it feels good. Since 2009, Old Glory has flown 19 missions, honoring more than 1,600 veterans. Each flight, of course, is special and leaves each veteran humbled and full of pride. But when you talk about healing and you talk about finding a sense of peace, this day, to these veterans, is etched in them forever. Oh, more than I ever imagined. Way more. I just feel just great. I'll never forget this day. I never will. I think it changed my life. It really did.